In this section, we'll discuss what reflexes are and how they're produced by an assembly of receptors, neurons, and effectors. We'll also survey different types of neuromuscular reflexes and how they're important to our motor coordination. Reflexes are quick, involuntary, stereotyped reactions of glands or muscle to stimulation. The automatic responses of sensory input that occur without our intent or even our awareness. Sometimes the information doesn't even make it to the brain before the reflex elicits its effect. There are four important properties of a reflex. First of all, they require stimulation. They're not spontaneous actions, simply responses to sensory input. They're quick. They involve few, if any, interneurons, sometimes just a sensory neuron synapses directly on a motor neuron. Reflexes are also involuntary. They occur without our intent. And although we can suppress them, they are very difficult to suppress. So it's an automatic response. They're also stereotyped. That means that they occur in essentially the same way every time. Most of us have had our reflexes tested with a little rubber hammer where a tap to the knee produces an uncontrollable jerk of the leg. Reflexes can include glandular secretion and contraction of all three types of muscles. Some are learned responses, that is conditioned reflexes. However, in this section, we're dealing with unlearned skeletal muscle reflexes that are mediated by the brain stem and spinal cord. They're called somatic reflexes since they involve the somatic nervous system and the muscles. The general pathway of a reflex arc involves somatic receptors in the skin or muscles or tendons. Afferent nerve fibers, A comes before E, so sensory information carrying, coming from the receptors into the posterior horn of the spinal cord or the brainstem. There's an integrating center, a point of synaptic contact between neurons in the gray matter of the spinal cord or the brainstem. This determines whether the efferent neurons will actually issue a signal to the muscles. After the signal has been integrated, might just be at the level of the spinal cord, an efferent nerve fiber will carry motor impulses to skeletal muscle to elicit a response when the skeletal muscles receive the signal. Let's first look at the muscle spindle. The muscle spindle is composed of stretch receptors that are embedded in the skeletal muscles. Remember, the proprioceptors are specialized sense organs that monitor the position and movement of the body parts. These are involved in the muscle spindles. They inform the brain of the muscle length and of the body's movement. It enables the brain to send motor commands back to the muscles that control a coordinated movement, corrective reflex, muscle tone, and maintain posture. Let's look at the general structure of it. We'll see that there are extrafusal muscle fibers. These are the muscle fibers that are not involved in the spindle itself. The intrafusal muscle fibers are the muscles within the spindle. The intrafusal fibers are modified muscle cells that have sarcomeres and contractile ability only at the two ends. The middle of the fiber lacks any sarcomeres and cannot contract. There are two classes of intrafusal fibers. There are nuclear chain fibers, which have a single file of nuclei in the non-contractile region. And then there are nuclear bag fibers, which are fatter and about twice as long. They have nuclei clustered in a bag-like middle region. You can see those exhibited here, nuclear chain fibers and then nuclear bag fibers. There are three classes of nerve fibers in the muscle spindle. The first two are sensory fibers and they detect changes in muscle length. And the third is a motor fiber that adjusts the length of the muscle spindle itself. The primary afferent fiber or group 1A fiber 
coils around the middle of both nuclear chain and nuclear bag fibers. They can be seen in yellow in the figure to the right. They are large, fast nerve fibers, and they're very sensitive to small changes in muscle length. If the muscle length changes, then those fibers will send a signal to the brain. There are secondary afferent group fibers, which are group 2 fibers, which wind primarily around the nuclear chain fibers. They are intermediate fibers with slower conduction speed than the primary afferents. These fibers inform the brain of the muscle length, but are less responsive to the rate of muscle shortening and lengthening. Finally, there are gamma motor neurons. These originate in the anterior horn of the spinal cord and lead to the contractile ends of the interfusal fibers. They're relatively small diameter and slow. Again, they cause contraction to fine tune the length of the muscle spindle fibers. They're much slower than the alpha motor neurons, which we'll see are involved in contraction of the muscle fibers themselves, that is, the extrafusal muscle fibers outside of the muscle spindle. So let's look at a stretch reflex. The stretch reflex is when a muscle is stretched, it fights back. The muscle spindles are involved with this, and they cause a contraction which maintains increased tone and makes the muscle stiffer than an unstretched muscle. This helps us maintain equilibrium and posture, as well as stabilizing joints by balancing tension in the extensors and flexors, which smooths the muscle's actions. A stretch reflex is mediated primarily by the brain, so it's not strictly a spinal reflex, although it does have a spinal component. The tendon reflex is a reflexive contraction of a muscle when the tendon is tapped. The knee jerk or patellar reflex is an example of this. This one is monosynaptic. It only synapses once from the afferent to the efferent neuron. There's no interneuron at all. When we test the somatic reflexes, it helps diagnose many diseases. The tendon reflex is one we use to test reflexes very frequently. We'll also see reciprocal inhibition. This is a reflex phenomenon that prevents muscles from working against each other by inhibiting the antagonist. So let's look at the patellar tendon reflex arc. It begins where we have an extensor muscle being stretched. When the patellar tendon is hit, the muscle becomes stretched. The muscle spindle is stimulated, and we'll see the primary afferent neuron becomes excited and sends a signal in through the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Perhaps you want to diagram this as we go along. After all, it is one of the major components of the diagramming assignment this week. Once the signal from the primary afferent neuron reaches the dorsal horn, it stimulates an alpha motor neuron that will innervate the extensor muscle. Some branches will reach to the brain, and other branches will synapse on an inhibitory interneuron in order to allow antagonistic action of the flexor muscle. The alpha motor neuron stimulates the extensor muscle to contract, thus shortening the quadriceps muscle. So the hamstrings muscle needs to relax in order to allow that extension. So take a moment here to diagram out this patellar tendon reflex arc Involving the muscle spindle, consider the primary afferent neuron, as well as the alpha motor neuron and the antagonistic motor neuron that will innervate the flexor muscles of the hamstrings in this case. It's important to consider what's going on in the central region of the spinal cord. This assignment summarizes a lot of the information we've learned so far. Here we've got a dorsal root ganglion and a cell body in the dorsal root ganglion. This sensory information passing into the dorsal horn. The involvement of an interneuron. 
or a direct connection to a motor neuron. Many things are covered here, so spend some time and get this straight. Let's look at another reflex, the flexor or withdrawal reflex. This is like when you step on something sharp or touch a hot stove. You can tell there's a little bit more going on in here. Again, you're going to diagram this. So a flexor reflex is a quick contraction of the flexor muscles, resulting in a draw of the limb from injurious stimulus. It requires contraction of the flexors as well as relaxation of the extensors in that limb. It's a polysynaptic reflex arc, meaning it has several synapses. It's a pathway in which signals travel over many synapses on their way back to the muscle. Here's the example. First, we step on some glass. The pain receptors in our foot send a signal up all the way into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. This will then be transmitted to many other regions using interneurons. The interneurons are going to synapse on the interneurons, could be inhibitory interneurons or stimulatory interneurons. We need a stimulatory interneuron to innervate the flexor muscle and contract the hamstring, moving the foot off the glass. We also need an inhibitory interneuron to tell the opposing muscle or the quadriceps muscle to relax so that that movement is actually effected. Now, in addition, we need stabilization of the muscles in the other leg. So here we'll have a contralateral effect where the motor neurons and the extensor are going to be stimulated and the motor neurons of the flexor are going to be inhibited. We call this the crossed extension reflex. That is, we'll see the opposite effect in the opposite limb. For example, try touching a hot stove, or maybe not, but as you withdraw the one hand, the opposite hand will extend. This allows us to maintain our balance. We'll also see ipsilateral reflex arcs, one in which the sensory input and the motor output are on the same side of the spinal cord. That's what we observed in the flexor reflex. The flexor reset flex was also an ipsilateral reflex arc. That is, the sensory input was on the same size, was on the same side as the motor output. A contralateral reflex arc was seen in the crossed extension reflex, one in which the input and output are on opposite sides. So the withdrawal reflex exhibits both of these types of reflex arcs. Sometimes we'll also see intersegmental reflex arcs. That's one where the input and output occur at different levels of the spinal cord. So now, spend some time putting together the diagram that involves a withdrawal reflex with a crossed extensor reflex. Remember, this involves an ipsilateral reflex arc so movement of the foot on the same side as the stimulus off the glass, and a contralateral reflex in which the standing leg is stabilized. Or when we remove our hand from a stove, the hand that was burned and moved is the ipsilateral side, and the hand that is moved in opposition to maintain balance is the contralateral side. It involves a number of different interneurons. Don't forget the details, dorsal horn, ventral horn, interneurons. Each output requires its own different interneuron. Is it a stimulatory interneuron or an inhibitory interneuron? This is a great exercise in logic. Let's look at one more reflex, tendon organ reflexes. Tendon organs are proprioceptors in a tendon near its junction with the muscle. The Golgi tendon organ is the perfect example. Its one millimeter long nerve fibers are entwined in the collagen fibers of the tendon. And they also, like the muscle spindle, detect stretch. However, if the tendon is really being stretched severely, 
we could be in danger of snapping it. So in order to avoid that, the tendon reflex causes the muscle to relax entirely and drop the load that it's carrying. So the tendon reflex occurs in response to excessive tension on the tendon. It inhibits the muscle from contracting strongly at all and moderates the contraction before it tears a tendon or pulls it loose from a muscle or bone. We'll see this tendon reflex in powerlifting when someone lifts a weight that's very heavy and they can no longer sustain that weight, it gets dropped instantly because the tension in the muscle cannot be maintained because of the inhibitory action of the tendon organs. So see if you can put this tendon organ reflex into place with maybe a biceps curl and fit all the pieces into a reflex arc like you did for the withdrawal reflex and the patellar tendon or knee jerk reflex. Now there's a number of different traumas that can occur in the spinal cord. Again, I'm not going to go into detail on this section. I'm going to leave you to explore it on your own and perhaps someone would like to take on something to do with stem cell research and the repair of spinal cords. Another great topic.